Yeah, guten tag, it's Rich from Hughes and Kettner here at NAM 2019 with Mr. Steve Stein. Hello. Steve, thank you so much for stopping by and taking the time. Absolutely, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. It's absolutely wonderful to have you on the Hughes and Kettner couch, one of the top YouTube educators in the world, and now a proud player of the Blue Lit Amps as well, right? That is correct, yeah. yeah. So tell me about your NAM show so far. What have you seen? What's been the best experience? What's been the, the worst experience? What's happened? Well, so far, I mean, it's just been busy the whole time. I haven't really had a chance to look at much of anything. Um, but I tell you, one of the coolest things was, of course, going out for supper with all you guys, which was really neat. Um, and then last night, we had a kind of a YouTube meeting where all the YouTubers got together and we all just hung out. It was it was absolutely crazy. I've seen the Instagram pictures. What happened? Can you reveal any of it? I cannot. It's I, I, I'll get kicked out of the group if I say anything, so I'm not allowed to. <laughs> what have you seen product-wise then at the NAMM show? Anything super cool that you'd want to recommend to people to check out? Well, honestly, I, I've, I've got a bunch of people that have asked me to go around and take some photos, which I'll be doing today. Um, but the new KRK G4s I was checking out, which I'm really excited about. Um, Metzabarba has got a, a new amp. Metzabarba's a guy I know, f f and he's just a really wonderful guy. Ibanez has got some great stuff. Uh, Fortin's got some new stuff. There's just all kinds of different stuff out there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I've got to go around and do the rounds myself at some point once I get off the booth, once I finish all the interviews and stuff like that. Yeah. I shall check all that stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on a little bit to, to Steve Stein then, the man. Tell us a little bit about your, your background as a YouTube educator, how you got into it, and where you got to where you are today. Oh my goodness, well that would be a really long story. Um, but to sum it up, you know, I started teaching when I was 17, and for me, um, teaching just kind of blew up. Like I was, I was good at it, and people wanted to take lessons, so I was always, always, uh, you know, packed with students. And then, you know, I became a professor at the local college. I was a Montessori instructor for many years, if you know what Montessori education is. All those sorts of things, played in bands, and, um, I don't even remember what year it was, but I, I, I was so busy with so many things and I got this idea, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could do uh, like an online class where I could have 10 people or 20 people in a class instead of just always having one-on-one. -on -one? So that's where the online thing sort of began and then it just, it just sort of spawned from there. Yeah. Now you are literally one of the top YouTube educators. Tell me what it's like to, to have this career as a person who delivers video education through YouTube. Well, it's, it's amazing and it's humbling, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility. Like, uh, you know, Justin Senecor and I were talking about last night. You know, it's, it's important that we understand that we impact people. You know, so what I say, I mean, you know what I mean? And, and, and I, I try and do the best I can to come across really trying to help people. It isn't just about me trying to show off to further my career. I love teaching. I, it's, it's what I've always been great at. And, and there's just something really awesome about having people go, oh, I, I get what you're saying. And, and that's, so that's, that's who I, what I do and who I am for sure. Did you have a teacher yourself who got you into the teaching aspect? Were you inspired by somebody? Or? You know, when I first started playing, I didn't, I, I, I grew up and I still live in Fargo, North Dakota, and there just, there wasn't a lot of teachers at that time. So I was doing the, like I did a thing with Guitar World yesterday and I was talking to Brad Tolinsky, and Brad was one of those guys that I was learning from, from Guitar World magazines when I was a little kid. And, um, and it wasn't until really when I went to college and I, I College was wonderful, don't get me wrong, but what was really great about college was meeting the people and the jamming and the rehearsing and all those things, that's kind of where the whole thing started and uh, I just learned an amazing amount of, of stuff, again, not just in college, but from those relationships, so, yeah. yeah. So what would be some of the most popular lessons that you teach or the most popular requests that you get from guitar students? You know, the, the biggest thing I think people come to me for, I, I do all kinds of different things, but um, I, I think it's soloing, understanding the concepts of soloing or ideas to help them, you know, better understand how to approach soloing, whether it's blues soloing or rock soloing or, you know, pop, you know, uh, major soloing, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I guess, I guess the big thing is, is, you know, with YouTube especially is, is trying to learn how to get a point across in 10 or 15 or 20 minutes of something that they can really utilize so they can walk away going, oh, I, I, I didn't understand the first thing, so I don't, and I think that's the most important thing is, 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 I think people get that out of my stuff. Yeah. 
A big thing with YouTube and videos nowadays is retention. People staying with videos, but they stay with yours, right? Because they need to know, they want to learn from you. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly hope so. I mean, it certainly seems that way. Yeah. You know, and that's that's kind of the thing is just to keep offering stuff out there. You know, I've got a lot of, you know, contrary to what I look like and what a lot of people might think, I uh, I love beginner stuff. I love teaching people that beginner stuff of, you know, how do chords work or how does a one four five work or how does, you know, the the chordal theory work or what is a scale or you know, I just love that kind of stuff. So I have lots of videos on those things too. Um, and I'll just keep making, whether they're, they're big hits or not, it doesn't matter to me. I just make things that I think are going to help people. And if they do really well, great. And if they don't, it, it doesn't really make any difference to me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And what about the importance of gear to you? I notice you're, you're an Ibergenes guy through and through. Yeah. You're playing the H&K amps at the moment. Tell yep. me about that aspect of your life as a guitarist. Okay, well, I started playing Ibanez gems back in 1987 when they first came out. A buddy of mine both bought our, a gem. I bought a pink one, he bought a green one, because that was really popular at the time. And, uh, and then it was in the early 90s, I started using EMG pickups. And it was really this combination that I think has always kind of been my thing. Like I can take this and plug into just about anything and make it work. But having said that, there are certain amps like I'm not a I, I'm not a kind of guy that wants to sit around and, and tweak an amp for four hours and I, I'm not saying anything negative about it if you're that kind of person I think that's wonderful that's not me I just want to plug in and play and for me Hughes and Kentner is that kind of amp and I'm not just saying that it really is it's it's if, if there were some people here like him over there that were, was watching me dial us in and it's literally just pushing the, the mids a little bit finding where I want my gain structure to be and there's so much more on this amp that I'm sure we'll talk about um, but I can dial it in. I get a clean, I get a crunch, I get a, a lead channel, and I'm kind of done. Yeah. So this amp is just really easy, and that's what I like. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe someday I'll become one of those people that really likes to sit and, you know, like with a camper or something like that. I think that's all wonderful, and I, I appreciate it, but it's really just not me. I, I just like to be able to plug in and get sounds that I really quick. I'm sure a factor like that is important with learning guitarists as well for inspiration and stuff like that, isn't it? I mean, if you're struggling to dial in sounds that you like or if you're struggling with a guitar that doesn't really suit you or your style of playing you're not going to carry on learning you're not going to keep up improving are you that's absolutely the truth now there's two pieces to that number one is is what you just said is absolutely right if you're if you have to fight your gear if you have to fight your guitar you know or fight your guitar strings or fight the amp or something like that to make something work because somebody told you that that's what you should have that's a that's a terrible way to start you know, look at me for God's sakes, I'm a little guy. I, I don't want 13 gauge strings on my guitar, you know? So I, I want stuff that's easy for me and it inspires me to play. Now, inspiration and creativity absolutely can come from, you know, having a pedal that you're, you know, some sort of delay pedal that you're exploring and all of a sudden you're in a complete, and that's something that I've, I've found recently that I really love to do. But I don't spend my life doing those things. I'd rather be practicing and creating, but if that effect or whatever it is puts me in that space and all of a sudden I'm doing something that I don't normally do, I love it. I don't know that I would recommend that to a beginner though because then you're not really getting anywhere. Like, because it's very easy to get lost in all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there any one specific set thing that you would recommend to beginners as a, as a first thing to get them into the guitar? In terms of which part? Just getting them inspired to pick it up, to start playing a first riff that's going to make them think, oh yeah, this is something I can do. Or is that too wide a topic well, to no, cover in, no, one, no. in one question? No, I don't think so. I, I, think, I think the big thing is, is number one, you got to find, you got to find some help. Whether it's online, whether it's a local music store, something. You have to find someone that you can trust, that is thinking about you. Like one thing I never did, I, I taught for 30 years in, in my hometown and I never used books. Because what I would do is the, the student, regardless of the age, would come in and sit down and I would figure out what this person wants, not what I think that person should have, but what that, and I've got minions all over this country that play in bands and things like that because I've been teaching for so long. You know, if, if they don't want to learn how to read, and don't get me wrong, all of it is important, but if, if they don't want to learn how to read music or they don't want to learn theory or they don't want to learn whatever, but they have an actual outlet to do what they want to do, I, who am I to say that that's wrong? Yeah. 
You know what I mean? So, so that's for me the big thing is is finding the teacher that is willing to to meet you on your level and give you what you need. Because back in my day, a lot of times, you know, you'd go, man, lessons just suck because I wanted to learn how to play Led Zeppelin, but my teacher wouldn't teach it to me. Yeah. Well, why not? I mean, if you can if you can feed a, a, a beginner something that is exciting, they go home and practice. Really quick story, super quick story. I was used this girl, I don't remember what her name was, but she was what we'll call a, a goth girl. And she was taking lessons from me. I've had, I've had so many students I can't even tell you, but she was taking lessons and I was trying to teach her some chords and she just saw no value in that. So she wouldn't practice and I didn't know what to do with her and I'm like, well, what do you like? And she's like, well, I love Metallica. I said, what song do you like? She goes, well, I love Master of Puppets. Now, anybody that plays guitars knows that Master of Puppets is probably not a song that you teach to a beginner. But I taught her how to play that. She had no idea what she was doing. But her mom calls me later that week. She's like, I can't get her out of her bedroom. All she does is play. Now, I hope she continued on and found a better path, because that's not really the, but I was glad that at least she was playing, because the other way wasn't working. So you got to try things and you got to figure out what works for people. And that's that inspiration angle, isn't it? She found something that she really wanted to play and that set her on her journey, hopefully. That's right. And for me, that's what teaching is all about is, and, and again, I don't mean disrespect to anybody because if you're, if you're making a living at this music thing, I think it's wonderful all the way around. But I was never the performer that taught on the side to make money. I... I gave all my energy into trying to get people to want to play and I and I played in bands on the side of that. So that's kind of the way my career went. It's, you know, I love playing in bands and things like that, but I know my calling was, was teaching people and, and listening to them and trying to figure out what w would work best for them. And I think that translates well in the online world as well. So I was going to ask about that. Is there any difference between teaching someone face-to-face -face and teaching someone online? I mean, obviously, if you've got someone in a room with you, they can ask you questions. You can check what they're doing as they play. But can you replicate that with YouTube somehow? Well, see, okay, so that's a, that's a great question. The, the great thing about YouTube is there's all this stuff that's free out there. The, the bummer of YouTube is, is if unless you're at a certain place and you're playing, it's hard to know what you're supposed to be doing and what comes next and all that sort of thing. So that's why I create guitar courses. Like I work for a company called Guitar Zoom, and we create guitar courses. We have a, a guitar club that you can you can be a part of, and what those are are really organized paths. So if you want to learn how to play blues, or you want to you're a beginning guitar player and you need to learn how to play, but you don't know where to go, that's what those things are for. Now, is the is the guitar course a, a great substitute for a real person? No, because you can't ask questions. Yeah. Right, so it's a it's a wonderful thing. But so what I do is I do live sessions as well. So I can I can talk to students and go. So tell me what what the problem is. Tell me where you're where you're confused or things like that, and do the best that I can with that. From my perspective, I still do. So I live in a little town just south of Fargo, and I still do these guitar classes, these beginner guitar classes, because I found I took two years off and I missed talking to people and I missed seeing them smile and I missed telling really horrible jokes and so I started doing it again because I really wanted that element um, and it keeps me fresh in thinking about how they think about things which in turn helps the content that I'm creating anyway so yeah what would you tell to someone like me then who's stuck in a rut I'm looking around at the NAMM show, I'm seeing guys playing on every booth who are just, they're killing it, they're shredding it. Yep. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. It's making me feel very demoralized and yep. stuff like that. I might be lying just to tell the story here, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell someone who's stuck in a rut? A okay. quick Steve Stein tip. Okay, well, again, there's two things. Number one is, the, the, the wonderful thing about online is you have access to all this stuff. The bummer of it is, is that people are inundated with information so they're like, it, it's the bright light theory, right? They're, they're learning something and then 20 minutes later, they're like, oh, I gotta have that. And then, you know, tomorrow they're, oh, I gotta have that. And then what happens is you never really absorb anything because you're just constantly on the, on the prowl. Now, if that's fun for you, that's wonderful. But it's hard to create a platform from that, you know? So the first thing I would say is, is, is learn to focus on, and you might need help answering this, but learn to focus on what you need at that moment, whether it's a structural element like a theory thing or a scale thing, or a creative element like a lick or a riff or something like that. I always encourage people to learn songs. I, my generation grew up learning songs and learning from songs, plus it, it made you excited. You know, if I could learn how to play an Aussie tune or an Alice Cooper tune or Black Sabbath tune or whatever it might be, 
I felt good about myself. So that's, that's the one side. The other side is this whole competition intimidation factor that we see. And I'm being completely honest with you. As I, I'm not going to say up the food chain, but as I move deeper into this world, what I realize is in this world, everybody's not concerned with who's faster or who's smarter. Everybody just plays. You know, you, you can't compare Joe Bonamassa to Steve Vai to Tommy Emmanuel to, you know, they're, they're all so vastly different from each other. So that's the second thing is, is, is the moment you stop worrying about what everybody else is doing, and I know it's hard, but the moment you stop doing that and the more you start focusing on what you can do and where you are and start building a platform from there, you become the player that you want to be. Because who am I to say that Ed Sheeran's any less a player than Eddie Van Halen? And I know somebody's going to comment, but that's not for me to say. They're both happy doing what they do, right? They just do it in different ways. So I, I think that's one of the most important things is figuring out your path, taking small bites of information and absorbing those things and, um, and not worrying about, you know, what maybe society is trying to tell you about gear. You know, like for me, I just, I want something I can plug in and start making music and I want to play. I don't want to play four hours from now. My inspiration is gone by then. I just want to play. That's one of the reasons why I love the, the amp, you know? So. so it's all about finding what you want to do, finding ways to inspire you to do it, and just getting on that path. It's an individual thing. That's right, and understanding that it really is long term. I mean, you know, you if, if you want to learn how to do the really crazy stuff, it requires a lot of time, and you have to be realistic. Like I tell people to look at your life. You know, if you're if you work nine to five, right, and you're 45 years old, and you've got a wife and three kids or whatever you got going on, you don't have eight hours a day to practice. Or probably don't. And that's okay. You know, it's being realistic going, what do I have and what can I do with the amount of time that I have so I enjoy this? I don't wake up every day being mad because I'm not as good as I want to be and I didn't get enough time because I had to help my kids with homework and, you know, all these sorts of things. Just be realistic and enjoy what it is. And it still will be frustrating at times, no doubt, but it's it's so much about your perception. That, that's what it is for me, man. I'm not... I'm me, I'm not Eddie Van Halen, and I'm not Ingve Malmsteen, and I love those guys, but I'm not. I, so, you know, Tim Pierce, if you, you know Tim. Yeah, I mean, Tim and I talk about that all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's learning to find who you are as opposed to always saying, well, someday, maybe you will someday, but right now, enjoy the ride. Right now, figure out what it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's an awesome tip. You are you, find out who you are, and join yourself on that journey. Yeah, and, and get better, you know, have goals. But, but don't just keep going tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. That's when it's going to... No, it's, it's now. Because nobody's guaranteeing you next year. So do something now. So I always explain to people, you know, have your short-term goals. It's like baby steps, right? Have your short-term tangible elements that will make you better. They will make you feel more confident, right? Better doesn't mean faster. Better can mean lots of... Maybe it's more be, a better understanding of things. Or your, your groove is better. You're locking into things better. Or you're communicating with other musicians better. There's lots of different things that you can do like that. Um, and then have kind of these big-term goals, but as long as you learn to develop this thing, you can keep stepping out until you achieve these other things. Yeah. Well, that is a whole lot to take in. Yeah. I hope it's inspired a lot of you guys out there. If by any chance you don't know who Steve Stein is, then get across. There will be links in the description. Go check out what he has to offer and what he has to say. And I'm sure, like all of us who have seen him before, you will learn a whole lot. Steve, once again, I could have asked you way more questions, <laughs> but I'm sure you've got other places to be. Yeah. Thank you so much again for taking the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was awesome. Yeah. Rich from Hughes & Kettner, Steve Stein, NAM 2019. We'll see you in the next video. Cheers.